Come, let us go on a journey back in time to take a heart-rending stroll through the night hours on the streets of London in mid-August 1894. Our guide for our journey into the past is a Victorian journalist whose article was reprinted by the Woolwich Gazette. We join him just before midnight after a heavy rain shower has drenched the streets and the summer mists are rolling off the Thames and draping themselves across the metropolis. It was not the kind of night on which anyone would choose to walk abroad for pleasure. Heavy rain had fallen during the evening, filling up every hollow in the roadways and making the pavements shine like mirrors under the rays of gas and electric light. A summer mist had settled over the West End, and showers descended at intervals with depressing regularity. Everyone who could by any possibility obtain shelter had done so. Many who would have slept in the streets had it been fine now broke on their small stock of money for the fourpence necessary to obtain admission to a common lodging house. Others whose means would not allow of fourpence had paid a copper or two for the shelter of a Salvation Army refuge. Were there any in the richest city in the world who could not even obtain the penny necessary for admission to the Blackfriars shelter? To answer this question the more accurately, I set out about midnight and went among the outcasts as one of themselves. The public houses were closing their doors. The great mass of theatre-goers had already departed by the last train to the suburbs, and the main streets were becoming comparatively deserted. Soon the street wanderers became conspicuous, slouching along the pavement or standing idly in front of the print shop windows. It was easy to distinguish them from the others who find business in seeking pleasure in the West End at midnight. Their clothes were of course well worn and of that peculiar neutral tint common to very old garments and all had their coat collars up as a slight protection against the weather. Most had pipes, often empty, in their mouths and they crept slowly on with hands in pockets as though not knowing what to do or where to go. In Charing Cross Road, near the Trafalgar Square end, is a circular seat around a tree. On this, a dozen were sitting, half of them men and half elderly women, about 50 years old. Several others were waiting around, leaning against lampposts, watching their opportunity to take the place of some of the sitters when they got up. I have seen many miserable specimens of womanhood in my time, but never have I come across any so repulsive as those sitting around the tree. Big, coarse-faced, ragged and dirty, they seem to have touched the bottom rung on the ladder of life and to have suddenly abandoned hope of rising higher. The next group I came across consisted of three men and one woman crouching over the overhanging entrance of a shop in Oxford Street. I took my place among them and, as an introduction, took out the inevitable pipe and asked for a match. They had none and their own pipes were low from shortness of tobacco, so it was a somewhat difficult matter to get the light I wanted. Here, give me your pipe, said one. With the utmost sang froid he put it in his own mouth and after a few pulls with it and his own clay, he managed to ignite it. Then he handed it back to me, and between the puffs, we started talking to one and another. Bit by bit, their stories came out. The woman had trudged from a town 33 miles in two days. She had been a servant, and she thought that she might get a situation in London. The night before, she had slept in the open in the country. Tonight, foot sore and dead beat, she was seeking such as could be had on the stone steps of a shop doorway. One of the men, a fine big fellow, a splendid specimen of the navvy, had only reached London a couple of days before. Having been thrown out of work in the country, he had set out on the usual tramp for London, only to find that he had jumped out of the frying pan into the fire. His face and clothes were tidy and clean, and he carried his wicker, food and tool basket by his side. The night before he had slept on the streets. He was doing the same this night and he had not the slightest prospect of getting anything to do on the coming day. It's odd you know, he said in a quiet uncomplaining way. It's real odd, what with the hanging about all night and getting no grub to eat during the day, a man won't feel much fit for a job even when it comes along. 
The third in our party had been selling flowers in the streets during the day and had not earned enough to procure him a shelter. While the fourth, a tall, gentlemanly fellow, dressed in black, was too tired to exchange a word with us and sat on the stones, his head resting on his arms, dozing fitfully. The police won't leave us alone, you know, said the navvy. Whenever they see us, they send us on. It's not their fault. They say they have to do it. But I can't see what harm we're doing sitting here. He had not long said this before we heard a regular footstep approaching us. Shh, the navvy whispered to the flower seller. Wake up the woman. Here comes a bobby. The woman had dozed off, but a push or two soon roused her. The policeman drew near, and we all did our best to look as though we were ordinary travellers resting for a moment from the passing shower. The constable must have noticed our movement and known our miserable pretending, but he was merciful. He steadily kept his eyes fixed on the other side of the road and hurried by without casting a glance our way. Well, he was a good un, murmured the navvy with a sigh of relief, as soon as the policeman had got out of earshot. There's not many like him. Some hurry you on as much as ever they can. After remaining a few minutes longer with the little company, I continued my tramp. Under the balcony of the Palace Theatre, and in almost every place where a slight shelter could be had, homeless men were standing or sitting. There were none in Trafalgar Square, the favourite resort a few years ago, but under the Adelphi arches was quite a small crowd. Those who know the arches will be aware that the wall goes in slightly on one side, leaving a ledge about six inches wide three or four feet from the ground. On this, the men were trying to sit, out of reach of the wet. On the open seats of the embankment, there were not so many as I had expected, though wherever a seat was at all under shelter, it was crowded. In that early morning hour, at two o'clock, with London at its quietest, strange thoughts passed through one's mind in that walk down London's finest boulevard. The rain had, for a time, ceased, though the air was still full of mist. The Thames, stretching away from the Houses of Parliament to Southwark, looked so beautiful. The innumerable lights of the embankments and bridges, the brilliant reflections on the surface of the water, the great piles of masonry looming up mysteriously into the semi-darkness, all seemed to tell of wealth, beauty and power. Yet I had but to turn my eyes to see ragged wretches creeping along in the shadows, minus shelter, minus food minus all that makes life attractive or even bearable. Surely there could be no greater contrast. At such a time, it is little comfort for one to seek to console himself with the maxims of orthodox political economy. It is one thing to talk of the fittest in the calm atmosphere of a scientific gathering, but it is quite another affair to oneself behold the crushing of the unfit. I took my place with five others on an embankment seat. Two or three were chatting loudly among themselves. If I had a blessed tenner, said one, I'd, I'd get another start, but I ain't got an apenny. Well, his companion replied, if you want money and you ain't got it, there's only one or two things to be done. You can beg it or you can steal it. Look at me. A little while ago I had board and lodging and 25 bob a week. And here I am now and so on, and so on. I could not help observing a noticeable difference between the men on the embankment and the group in Oxford Street. These here, with a few exceptions, struck me as being confirmed loafers, and in a conversation that I subsequently had with the police on duty, this impression was borne out. They are as wide awake as possible, while newcomers just doze on, said the police officer. Why don't you let them all sit still? I asked. If we did, every seat would be filled up the whole night, and many would be so horribly dirty that no one could sit on them the next day. You would not believe how filthy many of these loafers are. I have known cases where they have been so covered with vermin that the wonder is they were not eaten right away. But we do let them rest a bit, and then we send them on into the city, and the city police send them back to us. Most of the men here are simply lazy and won't work on any condition. Of course, we do get other kinds about, but with most of them, it is their own fault they are here. Is there nowhere else they can go? No shelter of any kind? I asked. There's the casual ward and the Salvation Army shelters. Nowhere else. No free shelters of any kind? No, 
If there were, they would soon be crowded out. The night was passing, and soon there came a stir. Dawn was slowly breaking. The byways of Fleet Street were already throbbing with the pulsations of many printing presses. Newspaper carts were rattling up the Strand, and Covent Garden was showing signs of business. In an hour or two, London would be fully awake again, and the ghosts would be hidden among the busy crowds thronging the streets that I had seen hushed and silent. <laughs>